Okay, welcome back. Uh, we'll just continue from where we stopped. So we uh, just started that passage from verses 15 to 18. Okay, so uh, I'll just read verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So this is what we were talking about, where um, when we are partaking in the Lord's table, uh, we are participating in what Christ did on the cross. That is, uh, we are... Um, we are receiving that for ourselves. So we are saying that whatever was accomplished on the cross is what uh, we are receiving for ourselves, and we are going to uh, we are going to be people who uh, share in the benefits of what was done on the cross for us. Um, and then verse 17, for we though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Uh, so apart from us individually receiving the blessings of the cross through the Lord's table, in verse 17 it says, we also um, uh, affirm our unity as a body of Christ, that uh, we are all one because we all take part in that one bread and one uh, one body of Christ. So we affirm our unity as one body under Christ's Lordship. Um, and then verse 18, observe Israel after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. Uh, so here, uh, what Paul is referring to is uh, that those uh, in Israel's history, uh, there was sacrifices that took place. Uh, so usually it would be the priests who would take part in the sacrifices and they would eat the meat that was uh, offered. Uh, some of the meat would go to the priests. Uh, but only with the Passover uh, meal was where that was shared by the whole of Israel. Right? So. Um, he views that as sacrifice. So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, um, he says, uh, let's, let me just open it here, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So he says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So um, he's referring to that sacrifice of the Passover lamb, uh, that the whole of Israel took part in that meat. So all of them um, were able to uh, receive the blessing of the Passover, which was the exodus from Egypt, right? So they, uh, they uh, took the blood of the Passover lamb, they covered it on their doors so that their houses, their uh, children would be protected. Um, so uh, when uh, the destroying angel was sent in Egypt and the first son of every family was killed, it was this blood of the Passover lamb that protected the people of Israel. Uh, and so in the same way he's saying, um, when you take part in these sacrifices, you are uh, receiving the blessings of that sacrifice. You are becoming uh, someone who is uh, taking part in that worship, taking part in that act of worship, and you are receiving uh, whatever it is that that sacrifice offers. So when you're doing it with the Passover, then you receive those blessings. Uh, but if you're doing it before an idol, uh, then you are participating in that worship and you are becoming one with uh, that act of worship to the idol. Uh, so that's what he will go on into in the following verses. If someone can read um, verses 19 to 24.
First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19 to 24. What am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Okay. So, um, in chapter 8, Paul had said an idol is nothing. So we know that an idol is nothing. Uh, we know that it is lifeless. It has no power. Uh, so uh, he goes back to that in verse 19, saying, uh, am I now saying that an idol is something or uh, that what is offered to idols is uh, has some uh, spiritual significance? Um, so he then says, uh, no, I'm not giving the idol value. I'm not giving that food offered to idols any value. Uh, instead, in verse 20, he says, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice is sacrificed to demons. So it's not that that physical object or that idol has any power, but behind that is a spiritual uh, or a demonic influence that draws people to uh, worship, the, uh, worship that physical object. So there is uh, spiritual blindness. There is... Um, there is some kind of deception, and that comes from uh, from a demonic uh, source. And so, when you are going to uh, worship, uh, or you are taking part in that food that is offered to the idol, although the physical object is nothing, that spiritual uh, work that is happening behind. Uh, that worship, that act of worship and that sacrifice is what you are taking part in. So you are taking part in the spiritual act rather than uh, rather than giving the idol value. I'm saying that there is something spiritual going on and that's what I want you to uh, recognize. That's what Paul is telling them. So verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table. So uh, he's saying you can participate and uh, be, uh, be in relationship with or be in communion with, be in fellowship with only one or the other. So you can be in communion with Jesus or you can be in communion with demons. You cannot do both. Okay, There is no... Uh, place for both in anyone's life. You choose one or the other. So if you're going, uh, if you are choosing to be part of what is happening with the demonic realm, then uh, you are choosing to forsake Christ. But if you are saying that you want to uh, participate in uh, what the cross offers, that you are receiving that full salvation in Christ, then you can have no... Um, there can be nothing in your life that has any participation with demonic work. Uh, so he's separating these two and he's saying you have to choose. So you can either choose to be part of the Lord's table, to take part in uh, this communion with the Lord, or you can choose to be part of, the, uh, take uh, this food that sacrificed to idols and be part of the demonic work that is there in uh in this worship of idols and in this sacrifice to idols. Uh, verse 22, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Uh, so like we read in Psalm 106 as well, uh, God's anger was against the Israelites because they had prostituted themselves. They had left their first love. Uh, they had abandoned God and gone after these other gods. They had chosen uh, they had chosen meat. They had chosen sexual immorality. They had uh, grumbled against God's chosen leaders. Uh, all of these things were a rebellion against God himself. And so uh, 
he's uh, saying when you are doing these things, if you uh, want to participate in this idol worship uh, by taking part in the food, by eating of the food, uh, then what you are doing is you are um, you are basically again rejecting God and you're choosing these other gods. You're choosing uh, that demonic uh, realm over uh, over the work that Christ has done for us, for our salvation. Um, and then verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So uh, this is a very important way to make decisions for uh, us, even in our regular life decision making, right? All things are lawful. So there are many things that are allowed, uh, whether legally by the government or whether acceptable in culture uh, around us. There are many things that are acceptable, but are those things truly helpful? Are they going to help us grow in Christ? Are they going to uh, help us in our walk with Christ, help us be better disciples of Christ or make us more Christ-like? Uh, those are the questions we should be asking. Uh, whether it is legal uh, as per the government or whether it's acceptable as per society is secondary. Uh, our first allegiance is to uh, God, to his law, uh, and to the things that he approves of. And so if what we are choosing in a moment aligns with God's heart and his will and his desires and his character, then we can go ahead with it. But if it is against those things, then we will choose to uh, not do it. Uh, and then verse 24, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So have that attitude of caring for another person over your own self. If it means that you sacrifice something so that the other person uh, will be well, uh, then be willing to make that sacrifice. Be willing to uh, be willing to do it for the other person's sake. So uh, the four points that he mentions, the main points as he's addressing this issue of eating food offered to idols, is the spiritual aspect of it, uh, right? Um, the second is uh, worship of God, worship of demons. Uh, the third is uh, whether it, uh, like evaluating, is this helpful? Is this edifying? Uh, is this really what is desired by Christ, by God for me? Or is it just something that's culturally acceptable? Uh, and the last is to consider the other person's well-being. So all of these things, when you're making that one decision about eating food offered to idols. Uh, we'll go on from there to verses 25 to 33. Would someone please read that for us? Verse 25. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for, co for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is said before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it, for the sake of the one who told you, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience I say not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food? over which I give thanks. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews, or to the Greeks, or to the Church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Thank you. Okay, so uh, earlier we had mentioned there were two scenarios in which people would 
had the opportunity to eat food offered two items. One was uh, meat that was sold in the market. So they would sacrifice meat in the temple, uh, uh, so sacrifice meat to their idols. And then part of the meat that was left over would go to the market is uh, to be sold as sold along with the other meat. Uh, now, sometimes that wouldn't be very obvious, which was the meat that had been offered to idols and which was other meat that had come into the market. Um, the other scenario would be where someone was in some kind of gathering, either near the temple or in the temple, and uh, there there was food offered to idols that was being offered as part of the meal. Uh, so now we had already discussed eating food in the temple. Um, so this is the case, uh, now he's talking about when there is food in the marketplace uh, that is being sold. So uh, he says here, uh, don't go uh, to the marketplace and start to ask, is this meat offered to idols? Uh, can I buy it? Don't go with that kind of consciousness. You just go buy whatever is there uh, and you pray over it. Uh, because everything that is created, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. So everything that is created, everything that is in the earth belongs to the Lord. Uh, and the Lord is master over all that is created. So you don't need to be, uh, his main intention here is don't uh, have a spirit of fear about this. Don't be worried about, is this meat offered to idol? Am I eating uh, some demonic food? That shouldn't be the uh, intention or the uh, posture in which we uh, have our food or think about our food. Uh, and he'll go on to say a little bit more about this. Um, so first Timothy 4, 3 to 5 uh, says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And so uh, this is uh, this should be our approach, that we receive everything that is available to us, uh, whatever food is available to us, we take it with thanksgiving, we pray over it, uh, we sanctify it by God's word and prayer, and we receive it with thanksgiving. So we can eat it without any fear of what has happened to it or uh, without any fear of getting sick or anything like that because uh, because all that is in the earth belongs to the Lord. Uh, Verses 27 to 30, now he goes to a different scenario. So the first one was where you're in the marketplace. He said, just eat whatever is there. Don't, don't worry about whether it is offered to idols or not. On the other hand, if you go to someone's house, uh, the same, uh, same rule will apply. You just eat whatever is offered to you. Don't ask questions. So you don't be concerned about what has happened to the meat. But if the person himself tells you that this is part of a sacrifice, then in that situation, you refrain from eating. Uh, and uh, why should you refrain from eating it? He says, for the sake of the other person's conscience. So you may be OK, you know that, OK, I belong to the Lord. I can pray over this food. Uh, and it's safe for me to eat. I can bless this food and I can dedicate it and dedicate. I'm already dedicated to the Lord so I can eat this food, all of those things. But uh, for the other person, they view it as you are partaking in their worship. You are partaking in that sacrifice that uh, that they did before their God. And so they may think that you um, in some way believe in the power of their God and uh, that you also are worshipping their God through that meal, right? Because in partaking of that food, it was a form of worship of that God or acknowledging uh, that God as uh, being divine uh, and that you're eating that food as a way to receive a blessing from that God. So to kind of uh, make sure that that person doesn't view uh, your faith wrongly and understand faith wrongly, you be clear and say, no, I won't eat this. Uh, but we always do it with uh, respect and gentleness. We never do it um, in a way that will um, that will offend the person. Uh, so verse 30. Um, let me read it from here. 
If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because of something I thank God for. Um, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God. Sorry, I have, uh, I've been having a cough, so that's irritating me a bit. I'll try to talk, but uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, so Rosalind has mentioned a question. Receiving food offered to idols is sin. Uh, like after receiving, you throw it out, but when they come and give, okay, so not wanting to offend uh, friends or neighbors. Um, yeah, so here uh, what Paul is saying is, if it's going to, um, I think it's important for us to understand what does it mean to that person? When they are giving you that food, do they view it as you are participating in their worship and do do they think that you are receiving it almost as a form of worship that you are participating in it if that is the way they are viewing it it's better not to uh, take it because you're misleading them in in kind of saying that yeah you are willing to participate in that worship so if there's a way to do it in a way that is respectful uh, and gentle and not offensive uh, then it's okay. Um, but if they are just coming and giving you food, if they themselves have not told you it's offered to idols, it's fine to take it and eat it. Uh, is that clear? I know it is a little bit, it is a very difficult situation in India. I, um, I know that uh, there were many times that I've also faced it, especially uh, when I was working where people would bring things back from the temple. Um, after some time, a lot of people just recognized that I wouldn't take it, and so they wouldn't come and give me a box of sweets. Um, so, yeah, if, if there's a way to do it in a way that is uh, respectful without offending them, uh, that is one way to do it, so that we are not uh, misleading them. Hope that's clear. Okay, so um, sorry, I'll just get some water.
Okay, we'll just continue from there. Um, yeah, so Paul concludes this saying, uh, do it all, whatever you're doing, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Uh, don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God. So um, don't be the reason that someone, someone else stumbles. Uh, but try to please everyone in every way, just as I try to please. So like we read in the previous chapter where he says he became all things to all people so that some may be saved. Uh, in the same way, he's saying, try to please everyone in every way. For I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Uh, and so this is how he will conclude this whole section on idol worship. Uh, so uh, he says um, the ultimate goal is the salvation of people. So anything that is going to hinder someone's salvation uh, should be avoided. Right. So his main issue with eating food offered to idols is that it, it may cause someone to stumble. And if it's going to cause someone to stumble, then why don't you avoid? Why don't you give up your own rights? Why don't you give up what uh, pleases you or your own knowledge, right? Even if you know that idols are nothing, uh, all of those things are secondary. The first thing and the primary thing should be your love for that person and your desire to see them saved. And uh, you should be willing to do whatever it takes so that they will be saved. Uh, and then follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Uh, so that is uh, the beginning of chapter uh, 11, where he says, uh, and it uh, provides a summary of all that he's been talking about. Uh, he's saying, uh, I will walk the way Christ walks, and so you can follow me in the same way. Imitate what I am doing. Uh, because in imitating me, uh, you are imitating Christ. And that is something for us as spiritual leaders, as uh, ministers, uh, to be people who uh, who display Christ to others. And even as we are leading people, when people are following us, that they are actually ultimately following Christ. Um, so uh, to lead the kinds of lives where uh, people can imitate us, where we are so much like Christ that people, when they imitate us, are imitating Christ. So we will go on from there to chapter 11. Um, I'll just read verse 2. So the first verse was, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And verse 2, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I have delivered them to you. So um, here um, Paul is just uh, telling them, uh, he's commending them for following things that have been passed down to them. So when he's talking about traditions, uh, that can be understood as ordinances, precepts, anything that has been handed down or uh, uh, that has been uh, given to them as a teaching, as uh, things that are to be followed in the church. So he's telling them um, that uh, that they've done a good job of following those things as it has as they've handed them down to them, they have continued to follow it just as it was given to them. And uh, they have remembered not only the teachings, but they've remembered Paul himself uh, in, or in the way they have conducted themselves. So they've been obedient to the teachings uh, of Paul as a leader, as the apostle, as the one who established this church. Um, So maybe we can just read the following verses from verse 3 to verse, um, I think it'll go all the way to 16. Till verse 16. Mm -hmm. 
But I want you to know the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head was shaped. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shown. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shown or shaped, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels, or because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but, but all things are from God. I continue. Uh, yes, still verse 16. Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Amen. Thank you. So uh, we will just continue from there. Uh, there is a table, and we will go to that after we look at these verses. Um, so the big question uh, that most people have about this passage is, is this something for the church to still follow today? Uh, should we still be covering our heads in worship? Should women still be covering their heads in worship? And so um, this table kind of looks at um, what was specific to the Corinthian church and what does the rest of scripture say? Um, so maybe we will look at that next week because we may not have, depending on how much time we have. Um, but we'll just look at this passage for now. Okay, uh, so the verse three, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. So when uh, the words used here for man and woman are specifically talking about a husband and a wife. So uh, when Paul is talking about this, he is uh, talking uh, from the perspective of a marriage relationship. Uh, so headship, uh, that spiritual headship is for the husband in a marriage relationship. It is not to say that all uh, men are the heads of all women, right? Uh, but it is to say that uh, in a family, uh, the man is the spiritual head of the family, uh, and the woman uh, is under his under his leadership. So will follow his leadership. Uh, so I want you to realize the head of every man is Christ, uh, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Uh, so the head of Christ is God is um, obviously to say that the son uh, uh, has submitted himself to the father. So just like uh, with the father and the son, Jesus and the father, uh, they are co-equal, right? They are um, equal in power, they are equal in authority, um, they are equal in uh, position, uh, but the son chose to willingly uh, submit himself to the father uh, and uh, to uh, come down to the earth uh, for our redemption. Okay, uh, in the same way, men and women are co equal, just as a father and son are equal, but the son submitted himself. So uh, let's quickly just take a look at Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Um, let's go from 5 to 8, if someone can read that. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So here we see that Christ uh, being in the very nature of God, uh, being one with the Father, uh, chose to submit himself and become a servant, uh, even to the point of death, that is for our salvation. Uh, in the same way, men and women are equal, have equal standing before God, have equal, uh, women are not lower than men. Uh, we'll just take a look at a few verses. So 1 Peter 3, 7, someone can read that. One Peter three seven. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. And Galatians three twenty eight. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Thank you. So uh, both these verses talk about in Christ, uh, we are equal, we share equally in um, in the inheritance that is us uh, through Christ, and uh, in Christ we are all made one, right? And then we see here in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 11 to 12, where he says, uh, In the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. So we can see clearly here, uh, that he's not trying to teach that women are lower than men. Uh, but he is uh, he is saying something about the relationship between men and women. Uh, so uh, the first thing is that the head of every man is Christ. That's referring to uh, someone who's a believer, right? So if someone is not a believer, then Christ is not their head. Um, and um, that, so we take this uh, in the context of a marriage relationship because the word uh, man uh, can refer to any male uh, or specifically to a husband and the word woman that's used here refers to any female or specifically to a wife. Um, so in uh, that context and even within uh, this cultural context where married women would cover their head. So it was uh, married women, it was uh, shown uh, that you are married uh, by covering your head. So that was a sign of being married. So if you left your head uncovered, it was uh, almost to tell someone that you are available or if you are, uh, yeah, if, if there's somebody who is interested. And usually it was uh, prostitutes who would leave their head uncovered. Uh, on the other hand, as we continue to look at this, uh, division within the Corinthian church between the uh, people from the higher uh, or more elite uh, status and those from the lower class. Uh, this was also something that was practiced where the higher class people would want to leave their head uncovered because um, because they would have uh, they would have their hair set and they would have uh, new hairstyles that they wanted to show off. But it was considered uh, 
to be sexually proper to cover your head because hair was looked at as an object of lust. So um, say today, if somebody wore um, very skimpy clothing, if a lady wore very skimpy clothing, that might be considered as uh, something where they are um, they're trying to draw attention or uh, where there is opportunity for someone to lust after them. In the same way, uh, in this culture, uh, if someone was leaving their hair un, uh, uncovered, it was like a way to draw attention and it was considered as a way to uh, get, uh, get someone attracted to you. And so uh, when he's calling them to cover their heads, it's both from this uh, perspective of modesty, from the perspective of showing that you are someone who is married, and uh, the perspective that uh, there should not be differentiation between the, uh, the higher or the upper class and the lower class, that all people when we come into the church uh, are equal. So uh, it's important for us to understand the cultural context here. Um, let's go on to verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But everyone who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors his, her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. Um, but if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace, then she should cover her head. So all of these things are just being used in support of, um, in support of uh, what Paul has said initially that women should cover their head and men should leave their heads uncovered. So uh, the practice was for women to have their heads covered, uh, but not for men. And so he's encouraging that practice to continue. Uh, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Uh, so this is where he's going back to Genesis and talking about who was created first, right? Man was created first and then woman was created. Uh, so all these are just being used as uh, ways to show that, okay, there is some... Uh, some place of authority that the man has over the woman. Uh, but at the same time, not to say that men are uh, higher or uh, have more value than women. That is not the point. The point is to communicate that, uh, that leadership role that the man has in the context of marriage. Um, Yeah, so verse 15, if a woman has long hair, is it, her it is her glory, for long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor to the churches of God. Uh, so this whole section is basically um, all supporting uh, that practice of covering the hair, but within the cultural context. So we will start looking at this table. Um, so the first thing is about spiritual headship versus head covering, okay? Uh, so 1 Corinthians 11, 5 to 16 is covering this topic of head covering, uh, but this is the only place in the New Testament where head covering is talked about. So uh, we'll understand it as specific to the Corinthian church that he was uh, teaching them about head covering and saying that this is proper for their cultural context. Uh, whereas spiritual headship, which he is also talking about in connection to head covering, spiritual headship is the principle uh, that is spoken about uh, in other parts of the New Testament. And so spiritual headship is something that we will continue to practice in our churches today uh, and in our families um, within the church. So uh, to say that the husband has a role of a spiritual leader within the household uh, is something that is taught in other parts of the New Testament. Uh, we can look at uh, maybe Ephesians 5, 20 to 23 and verse 33. We'll just look at that one passage. Okay. 
verse 22 wives submit to your own husbands as to the lord for the husband is head of the wife as also christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body therefore just as the church is subject to christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything husbands love your wives just as christ also loved the church and gave himself for them that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Thank you. So, um... There are several other passages uh, talking about the same thing of the spiritual headship of the husband. Uh, we won't read all of them, but this is just to say that when we can see something taught in other parts in the New Testament, then we can say that this is authoritative in the sense that it is something that still needs to be followed in the church today. Uh, whereas head covering is only mentioned in this one place. Spiritual headship is mentioned in several other passages in the New Testament. Uh, in the rest of this chapter, there are two other things that Paul will talk about. One is the Lord's table. Um, so we see that uh, in the New Testament, there are several passages that also talk about the Lord's table. So again, we, uh, we will say that we are to continue practicing uh, that partaking of the bread and the uh, wine uh, as a remembrance of what Christ did for us on the cross uh, because the New Testament continues to teach that. It doesn't uh, mention it only once, it mentions it several times. Uh, on the other hand, improper behavior while eating or drinking. So uh, Paul will talk about this a little later in the chapter where there is judgment that is come upon uh, the Corinthian church, or they have, um, they are experiencing sickness and death within the church. And he relates this to uh, them uh, taking part in the Lord's table in a way that is not uh, acceptable or not, uh, not proper, not uh, what God approves of. And so, uh, that judgment is specific to the Corinthian church. That is not something that we uh, need to continue to worry about uh, today. And we look more at why we don't need to worry about that uh, as we look through the chapter. Um, a third, the third part of this uh, chapter, we'll look at whether women can pray, prophesy, and preach within the church. So we see women uh, mentioned uh, in many parts of the New Testament as uh, leaders within the church, as prophetesses, as people who were teaching, people who were praying, people who were leading the church. Um, it's only here in 1 Corinthians 14 and in 1 Timothy 2 that women are asked to be silent. Uh, so that we will see as specific to the Corinthian church and uh, in, in 1 Timothy to the church in Ephesus. Uh, so these are specific to their context and for a reason that we will uh, we will look at why Paul was saying that. Uh, so just to look at this as there are some things that are specific to the context of the church, to the culture of that day. And there are some things that we can take uh, as things that we still need to follow today within the church. Uh, so starting with the head covering was something that was cultural, that was specific to the Corinthian context, uh, versus spiritual hedge, which is something that we still continue to practice within the church today. Uh, so uh, those are the two things that Paul covers in these first 16 verses of chapter 11. Um, we'll continue from there next week. Uh, sorry, we didn't have time to talk about any questions, uh, but maybe next week we can talk about any questions that you have and then go into the rest of the chapter. Thank you all. Thank you, Pastor.